Thanks, and thank you for um, the invitation. I'm a relatively newcomer to Pepham, um, only a couple of years ago, and uh, I hope I can say something that uh, you, you all haven't heard before. So um, this comes up uh, with work I've been doing with Jenny uh, and Tamara, and more recently, Philip and Edwin, um, about what turned out to be normalization by evaluation, which I think is a long-time interest of, of Pepham. Um, okay. So um, I'm talking about Prex, and this is a couple of years ago. Um, we presented it in Pepham. Um, I couldn't come because of visas, so I'm very happy I, could, I was able to come this year with a visa. Um, so Prex, you can view it as a uh, library for algebraic solver that's extensible, okay? Um, so what does that mean? That means the library supports some solvers called monoids or combinatorial monoids, so simplifying and, and, and proving um, that two things are equal, but it's also extensible, so you can add your own if it doesn't support uh, your, your uh, algebraic structure of, of uh, flavor. And you've used it to do um, partial evaluation or, or, or sage computation, okay? Well, in this case, we can get a linear boost uh, speed up in matrix multiplication as the sparsity goes up, and of course, there is no Hansa semantics contest. And I'm just gonna show quickly uh, what that looks like. So, uh, so we have a little matrix multiplication code here. We multiply in three matrices. One of them has knowns, the other knowns, the other one has unknowns. Okay, we wanna stage that uh, computation. Uh, we have in the dot operation, the mool operation. And uh, what this Prex library uses is an old technique, partially static data. Many some people in the room, you know, helped invent it. Um, where we kind of, we change just one little bit in this code. Instead of saying dot and emul, we say dot takes a ring, right? And emul matrix representation takes a ring. Okay, and now we're using this partially static representation under the hood and what gets staged. So here is a kind of naive staging, but here with partially static data, which Prex implements, we get just zero because that's what, what you get from this carefully chosen term. Okay, so it's one, two, one, two time. Fantastic, okay? What I'm gonna tell you about today Okay, is what I've recently been doing with, with Prex, uh, with Jeremy and uh, Edwin Brady. Um, and it's, it's, it's not finished, this is work in progress, so I'm very excited to talk about it here. Uh, it's a good way of kind of pitching to you, seeing if it makes sense, seeing if it's been done before, uh, and so on. And I'm very relatively new, kind of both to Pepper and to kind of programming, so this could all have been done many years ago, and, and what I hope is you at least tell me something new in the process, or at least, you know, be your jester for the afternoon. Okay, so I'm gonna move to the editor now, which we set up before, okay? And this is a little Idris program, okay? And um, what we're looking at now with Prex is indexing modular equations, okay? So before I, I tell you more about indexing modular equations, let's look just a bit at Idris because it's really a remarkable little system by Edwin Brady. So just a brief overview uh, of it. Um, it's a purely functional language with dependent types. It's strict, but you can uh, delay computation if you wanted to. Um, you can, you can keep to a, a total fragment of it if you wanted to, there's a simple totality checker. Will and I had some fun over the summer breaking it, <laughs> which was nice. Um, it compiles to multiple backends, so you can compile it to JavaScript, C, Spring, so you can actually write applications with it. It's not just a theorem tool, um, which is very nice. Okay, so that's just about Idris. Uh, Edwin is now working on Idris 2, which I've been using to do Prex, but in this talk, I'm just gonna use uh, Idris 1 because I'm not actually gonna show you the Prex code. I'm gonna show you the problem. Okay, about um, indexing modular equations. Now, Idris looks a lot like Haskell, that's intentional, okay, so this might as well have been written in Haskell, but fairly quickly you'll see it, it looks a bit different. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is we're gonna index our data types, our dependent types, dependent types, with computation. Okay, so let's just start by defining a little domain. Here it's uh, bits with modular arithmetic. Okay, so we're defining the mod2 mod function that takes an natural numbers and gives you back its parity. Okay, just a simple pattern matching. And now we turn, we define two operations on it, plus and times, and of course this is the wrong way to define them. If I see uh, Edwin uh, giggling at the back, because this is gonna cause you no end trouble later on. And in fact, this is what I want to show, is what, what trouble you're gonna get into if you don't write the right thing up front. And this is what I'm trying to uh, do with Prex, is of course, you wanna write right code and write it correctly, but you shouldn't get stuck if you start the wrong way. To be able to get to the end and then refactor is what I would say. You shouldn't just be able to, just, just stop. It's not nice. And you should be able to explore the space of programs before you get stuck. Okay, so we're defining this choose function, the choose between types. If it's odd, it takes the odds. 
which is even if it's single, right? So it has three arguments, an even type, an odd type, and then a bet. And depending on that bet, it's either a first or a second. And what we're going to use this function to do is to define alternating lists. So these are lists where you alternate between two types. Okay, you might start with type that's odd, but then the next one is going to be even. Okay, and I'm going to index it in a way that's going to make probably Edwin uh, cringe in the back. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, of course, of course, uh, uh, James, James, of course. Edwin doesn't cringe that, that easily. <laughs> so so uh, we're defining the alternating list type. It takes the two types, even and odd, and then it tells you which parity it starts with and then which parity uh, the length is, okay? And that's the list. That tells you exactly how it should be. So the nil, you can have in any, in any parity, but for consing, well, you have to take some, an element of the right type and then a list of the next, the opposite parities, and then you index it by this computation one plus parity. Now remember, one plus here was defined in a very, very naughty way. Like this. This is gonna cause us no end of trouble, and that's intentional. Okay, and of course you only, re because the, you only realize it was no end of trouble when you're in that trouble. Okay, and my goal is to say, well that shouldn't be a showstopper, okay? And of course, when we write it the second time, we want to write it in a different way, maybe. Or maybe that we, there's two right ways to write it, but they're incompatible. So we're going to have to write it one way because that's the common way, and then be able to deal with the other way. And I don't know, I don't have a way to do it right now, but, but I'm still hopeful. So, so the talk is about why I'm hopeful. Okay, so, so of course, once you write lists, you want to concatenate them. Okay, and, and now uh, what we want to write uh, is this concatenate function that takes uh, even and odd, and even and odd, and gives you an even and odd. And uh, you know, I'm starting with some parity, so the concatenate list is going to start in the same uh, parity because I'm doing it from the left. Um, and then I have to do a little kind of more computational arithmetic on the indexes as I go along. And, and really, James is shaking his head, and, and that's for very good reason because this is really no end of trouble when we index our types by computations, okay? Because, well, this is what happens, okay? This is the recipe for disaster. We start with computation indices. Now, we're working with them. We have terms. Terms are open. They have variables. Worse, the types of them have variables in them, okay? And now the type checker needs to make sure that things match up. And so computations get stuck because there's variables there. And the unification doesn't work because there's computations there. There's no constructors to help unification make progress. Um, we get this type error that's usually very cryptic because it's all normalized terms, okay? So we see this big loop of type theory, okay? And, but, if, but if we kind of work out what the equation is, we see it and say, come on, that's silly. You can't say that one plus x is x plus one. Okay, so I'm just gonna sh make it more concrete. We'll, we'll just chase it through this example uh, just to see it happen here kind of live, okay? Well, not really live, but. Okay, so just to prove, we get no, uh, oh, that's not what I want to do because I don't have a search there. Okay, it's, it's type checking and then it complains, I can't just write concatenate in, in, in this way because types don't match up here. It says, if I take a parity right and I turn it into an art and I take it modular, I don't end up in the same place. Okay, so I don't wanna do that. Okay, so what we do instead, what, what you, you, you know, need to do to get this program to, 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 to type check, okay, we first prove some algebraic laws. For example, in this case, we say zero plus x is x, okay? And I can cheat here, it's all fine. I can just enumerate them all. And I can do left neutral, right neutral, associativity, commutativity, so I have a commutative monoid. And in fact, the plan is, with Prex, is that when it's a finite type, it will just be able to prove all these equations for you. You won't even have to, to do this enumeration. Okay, I'll get, get back to it a bit later. Okay, but specifically to make this type check, not only did I have to show I have a commutative monoid, I also had to prove this lemma that says x plus one plus y equals one plus x plus y. And it's just a simple equation of proof. But it's so simple, I shouldn't, do, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have to do it. I really shouldn't. Okay, so let's go back to concatenation. Now I have all the moving pieces. The reason I know I have all the moving pieces is because well, I had to struggle a lot down there. Now I know what the pieces are, so I wrote them up, up front, right? So this, this took me a while because I'm not yet a, an expert, but uh, working on it. Okay, 
So we wanted to look at the, at the uh, uh, nil case, okay? So we're concatenating uh, the nil uh, list with some list. So of course we had to bring into scope all these meta variables that are behind the scene because we're gonna have to tell the type checker how to manipulate them. So we have to say that we have either an order and the power to write and the stuff. And now we take Ys and the type of Ys is an uh, alternating list with even an odd star plus zero power to write. And if you want uh, to, um, uh, and, and the result type has to be zero plus power to write. Now usually that's fine, as long as I can, uh, I, I, you can usually show that power to write matches zero plus power to write because there's nothing stopping computation to go, except that I chose a silly <laughs> implementation for zero plus. Right, so actually it actually can't say these two things are equal. So of course we don't expect the, to see star plus zero equals star because it's stuck on the, on the open term, on the, op on the variable, but of course in our case it can't see either way and I have to prove them both, which I can do. But for the second step it's even worse, right? So now I want to take some x cons x's concatenated with y's, so I have to bring into scope also the meta variable inside the cons Right, okay. And now even just to form X's concatenated with Y, so the intermediate term, I'm again in trouble. Okay, so the, the type of Y is in stars plus one plus parity, but in order to create a concatenation, I need this type. So I have to bring the rewrite here, okay. Luckily to do the conjuring, I don't need to, to do any more gymnastics in this case. And to get the result, I have to do a little bit more because uh, of, uh, of associativity. Okay, so I have to bring a bit more rewriting. Okay, and then uh, that completes the thing. So, 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 so the program. So my point is, um, we, we kind of, we saw how we got into trouble in each step. I think I only didn't have the example of unification getting into a model here. Uh, I think, uh, yeah. But we, we, we sort of saw examples of all, all along, right? So, so we're indexing by, by computations, then we need to bring in those weird type variables that get stuck. Um, then we have to, to uh, things get stuck. We have to do some manipulations that are all trivial. Okay, and this is all very frustrating because you, it, you're also trying to work out the shape of your general problem. And then you have this on top of it. Okay, I don't have a solution right now, but I think we might have one. Okay, so, oh, that's not what I wanted. Okay, so, so just in general what people do, what people do, right, is they say do not index by computations. Okay, avoid the green slime, this is what Connor calls it because of the font he uses in Agile. Okay, avoid the green slime. Instead what you do is you work out what all the equations you need to have. You work out an inductive representation of the quotient and you use that to index your data type. And James is nodding, so I know I hit the nail on the head. Okay. And then you index by those, and then of course because it's all constructors and it's all nice and you know, nice and nice and fun, you can do the bonanza mode where you can just you know, if you're using Agda, you do Control L, Control C, Control S, and everything just the program just writes itself, and it's so nice, right? Fantastic. But what I would really want, what the dream would be, is if actually I could say, well, okay, I know I'm not in bonanza mode right now, but actually you should be able to tell this using these equations. Okay, so maybe the type checker could work it out for itself. I mean, I don't, mean, well, we're gonna have to, to, to modify the type checkers with that, and of course I'm gonna have to convince someone like Edwin or James to kind of help me along with that, and that might take a while. But uh, I think we, we're in within reach of maybe telling it, well, you should be using the additive structure of Gen2 to find the normal form. Or maybe we have to add some more manual glue, but, but it really shouldn't be this, or I hope it will not be this kind of big group of, of, of Chunk <laughs> that I had to write. Okay, so 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 this is the dream. I mean, how far are we? I mean, I'm, I'm not, as I said, I'm external to this community. I'm just stepping in because there's a there's a certain program I want to write. Um, so of course, many people have done similar or already have, you know, solved this for themselves. So Koch, for example, you know, you, you don't do normalization. You have everything by tactics, but of course they have ring solvers, field solvers. There's some tactics for doing compositions using a few categories. I mean. I mean, Jack will have a lot <laughs> of experience there, <laughs> all right, of course. Um, another nice piece of work that, that I know of is, is uh, Edwin's, an Edwin student, uh, Frank Slama, Slama, where they did a, a very elaborate hierarchy of rewriting tactics or heuristics um, for, 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 
basically showing that those um, terms are equal. But what I'm gonna show now is you can think about the whole problem in this same, in this vocabulary of Rex, it lets you help come up with hopefully a solution. I don't have a solution yet, I'm not pretending to, but I'm working on it, that's why I'm excited about this right now. So, so what does Rex offer here? So first, I mean, it's not like a bespoke, it's not just a si single, okay, this is just a ring solver. This is a little bit arbitrary structured, okay? So it's general. Um, if you manage to, to represent the free extension, I'm gonna say what that is in a, in a minute, uh, it's sound and complete, so you're not missing out on any equation, okay? Um, it, if, even if it doesn't give you what you need, it gives you some tools to write what you need if you can, okay? And that helps you to do a solution to your problem, hopefully easier so that, you know, you don't have people just writing specific lemmas that look weird and say, okay, now what I have now is a commutative monoid. So what I have now is, is a, is a, is a um, distributive, distributive um, lattice, okay? And then they don't have to worry about this ever again so long as you're using the, the, the lattice operations, okay? So I'm gonna tell you what, Ma what Frex says very quickly because uh, I think this is the truth of the, of the pudding. Okay, so, so Frex is an idea for maths, right? So, so uh, it's, it's this uh, operation that algebra is to where you have some algebra and you say, let's add some, some indeterminates, let's add some variables. Okay, if you're categorically inclined, uh, you look at the category of algebras and you take the coproduct of an algebra with a single algebra. Um, you can think of it as a universal property for normalization or evaluation. I'm gonna tell you tell about that a bit more later. But from a programming perspective, what it gives you is this spec for solver. If you satisfy the spec, you have a solver and we have a system that can run with it. Okay, and that system can already do partially static data. It doesn't even need to, you don't even need to worry about the equation of course, it's gonna cause you all sorts of trouble if you don't. Um, but what we want to try to do with it is to try to do this size checking business. Okay, and also have tools to, to, so that you build your own uh, solutions. Am I okay for time? Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so to, to say what Frex is, the mathematical concept and its corresponding programming abstraction, just a little recap of algebra, of, about algebra. I, in an ideal world, all computer scientists would already know this, but in case you know, someone went to a university that didn't teach this, I'm gonna cover it. I'm not gonna give formal definition just because it doesn't matter. I mean, in a sense, I just wanna give you the feel for what are the building blocks you need for this. Okay, so we already can guess you need some operations and equations. So for example, a binary operation and a, a constant. Okay, and then you can talk about equations like x plus zero equals x, zero plus x. Okay, so, so this is a neut neutral element axioms, associativity and commutativity. So this is a, a commutative monoid axiom. So I'm using commutative monoid as a running example. Once you have those operations, you can talk about algebras for this presentation. Okay, so what an algebra, it's a set, it has structure. So each of those operations can be interpreted in that algebra. We have a binary operation, we have a nullary operation, and those operations have to validate the equation. Okay, so it's called universal algebra because you say for all x in the algebra, x plus zero is x. Okay, so for example, commutative monoids is a missing satisfying these equations. Okay, the whole morphism from between two algebras is a function in between the carriers, this is called a carrier, that preserves the operation. So this is for the binary operation and for the constant. So far, so good. So what is a free extension? Okay, so the type, the input type for a free extension is two things. It's an algebra, that's some presentation, and a set X, type X, you can think of it. And what the output is, it is, is a triple, uh, an algebra called the free extension of A by X, and then two, two function, one a homomorphism, X extension, and the other one is bar variable. Okay, so X is a homomorphism from the algebra into the extension, it extends the algebra. So you can think of it as saying, I'm taking everything in the algebra, say bits, and turn it into bits with other stuff. Okay, where the other stuff comes from, it comes from X. Okay, oh, was that one before it? Oh, perfect, thanks. Um, okay, and the other one is a function. So this has to be a homomorphism, so that means the operations in A need to be preserved. And this one is a, just a function. Okay, so this is how you think of everything in X as a, a variable in the extension. Okay, but of course it's not just a set, it's not just a union of variables and non-variables. It has algebraic structure, so I can start forming, you know, variable time, a constant, variable plus a constant, and so on. So it starts behaving like a polynomial. It starts behaving like partially static data st structure. It starts behaving like normalization by evaluation phrase. Okay. And 
So the free, so the free extension has this to that and it has a satisfied universal property. So I mean, for any other algebra, B, H, E, so it's an algebra B with homomorphism like this and a function like that. So there's a unique homomorphism going from AX to B that extends it. Okay. And as I said, for the categorically inclined, the free extension is the core product of an algebra and a free algebra. So I'm not going to go down that route. If you know about it, it's great. Okay, so that's the mathematical definition of the free extension. So why is this even applicable here? I mean, I gave you some intuition. I talked about variables and MBE. But also empirically, I mean, you, when you look at the structures that we use in computer science, what comes up is representation that you might already know, multinomials, bags. Okay, because this, this is stuff that's found in the literature when you're writing the, the, the first paper. Okay, it's not just you know, this little article was already out there. This just puts it all together. And so people here monetize that to their advantage, which is great. Because maths, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So, so uh, just maybe to give you a bit of a flavor of, of, of what goes into it, or why the, why the free extension, how, or how, how you can find the free extension, because in the end it's a mathematical, creative, data, data structure design activity. Right? How do you go about finding it? So let's, let's just look at the proof, or what involved in the proof, that uh, the free extension of a commutative monoid with some finite set of variable A. Okay, so, so the claim is, well, what is it? It's a pair of an element of the commutative monoid and a vector of n natural numbers. Okay, so why is that? Well, if we look at the value in this type, where it's a, it's a pair of an element of the algebra and some k natural numbers, and we think of it as a formal sum of a concrete value and then n indeterminants, but they might have coefficients because they might appear once, twice, three times. I can always group them together, right, to bring them to the same place. So, I mean, this is not rocket science if you've seen this before. If you haven't, it might blow your mind away, but that's good because that means you learned something. And if not, then there's more sophisticated things down the pipeline, so please don't get uh, discouraged by, by abstract algebra. It, it, it can be made challenging as well, sometimes unnecessarily. Okay, uh, and we define the, the operations on this algebra point-wise, but of course, when we view it in this, in this notation, it, it's kind of clear why, why they should be ho what they should be holding, okay, because you can just freely move things around in a commutative monoid. Okay. <coughs> And the, the, universal, the universal property, how come we can construct this homomorphism out of it? Well, if we have this data, so a homomorphism from the concrete part to B, and then a function that tells you what to choose for every variable, well, we can just substitute, given one of those polynomials, the values. And that's the only way we can do it. This is it. Okay, if you want a homomorphism, it has to be in this way. Okay, so that's the proof of why this, why this is the free extension. Okay. So I gave you some empirical reason why the free extension is relevant here. Maybe let's try to look at an maybe another more abstract justification because for me this, this really kind of comes out of nowhere. I kind of want to find a good independent basis of why, why it's relevant apart from it works. So, so another way to, to look, calculate the free extension of an algebra by a set of variables x is you construct terms okay, from variables using the operations of the algebra and the constants. And you're allowed to use the axioms, the axioms of the representation, but you're also allowed to evaluate. Okay? So what you get in the end, what this quotient is, it is a domain, a semantic domain for an NB algorithm, a normalization by evaluation algorithm. Evaluate the value in this domain, and there you have it, you have a normal form. Because all you're allowing is evaluation and the equations you care about. Of course, it doesn't tell you how to construct it unless maybe you've had quotients in your meta theory, okay? But it specifies it, so once you have something, you can say, well, this is an NB because it has the universal property. Okay, and, and, and so what we're trying to do with Philip is to look, go beyond first order theories because NB is usually for higher order theories and second order, lambda, the lambda calculus, because it gets really interesting with functions, okay? But you can view uh, theories of functions, say the lambda calculus, as second order theories. They're still universal in some way, but it's a bit more sophisticated. A lot of work on that, Fiore and, and Haman, <laughs> Haman, I think, and, and, and others. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's not just us. We found, uh, Martin Hallen wrote about it in, in, in 2012, where he found out that some models of the lambda calculus, uh, when you add some uninterpreted constants, are equivalent to free extensions of a certain kind of algebra. So it's, it's 
was encouraging sign that Nintendo was for more than just the kind of algebra he was looking at. So that's encouraging. Okay, so but that was on the math side, maybe maybe a little bit of theory of computation, but more practically, right? So so Frexton thing. So you can go and download the Haskell or Camel library if you've, if you've had. Ah, thanks. We have plenty of time for questions, I think. Um, okay, where where you know it gives you tools to uh, work with ex with one of the ready-made algebraic structures, so it's a moving monoid, and so this is all done, of course, through type classes or in Haskell and uh, modules in OCaml. Um, Jeremy tells me it was a bit nicer to do it in Haskell uh, than, than OCaml because the module system was a bit uh, going against the grain, I think, of, of what's happening. So I think there's some interesting work of making it usable in both languages. I don't think it should be just something that Haskell has got to uh, boast about. Um, and, and the Frex abstractions, the, the just a, s a function of spec, there's still some <coughs> ingenuity going into the implementation because you still want to get out an efficient implementation, an efficient staged program. So for example, if you look at the normal forms for the commuting monoids, what you get is this big sum over all variable, but of course, you just want to take the ones that are in the support, the ones where coefficient is not zero. I mean, this is a, a silly example, but once things get more complicated, you want to be a bit more careful as to how you construct this. Of course, and so long as you validate your result that it's correct, but some of them would be more efficient than the others. <laughs> okay, but satisfying it means you complete it, okay? And then writing, you know, the, the CD function from, from function static data is then very easy. You just use this um, uh, tupling homomorphism on quotation and splicing, and, and then you have it, it kind of pops out. So that's pretty cool. I, I find that a bit pretty, but that's a personal uh, rather than objective statement. Okay, so, so that's what you can do today, but I mean, I, I'm really excited by maybe what Frex can do tomorrow. Okay, so, so especially to, to do with, with type checking and modular equation. So, so I don't have any um, scientific evidence to say this is gonna work, so this is my adventure, and I've been having a lot of fun going down the Idris 2 path, right? But, but and what I've been doing is basically just teaching Idris about Frex. So, so teaching it about algebra, teaching it about uh, equations, <coughs> uh, universal properties, free extensions, in the process, I'm learning a lot of dependent types because this is my first dependent type program. So, so uh, I made some bad decisions early on and now I'm paying for them because <laughs> dependent type programming is challenging, but it's, it's, it's fun. Um, and, and I've just been using Idris because it was lying you know, on my desk. I was reading th through Edwin's book, but, but I've not been using anything sophisticated. Idris was just Idris. Um, and in the process, I've been helping Edwin debug Idris too. And making things a bit more efficient. So ho hopefully I made the world a bit better, even if I don't have concrete results yet, sorry. Um, but hopefully soon. And we do want to do it in other systems as well, because I, I think, you know, people should deserve to, to, to finish their code <laughs> in time for production, even if it's not the prettiest. Uh, even if I didn't, so today I'm sorry. Okay, so, so I really want to, you know, what I'm currently thinking of is, trying to race towards this type checking modular equation. Um, hopefully other people will find it interesting. I, I find it the, the prospect fascinating. But also, I mean, I think having a nice spec for MD and a way of thinking about it in this way might be cool. I don't know if, it, if it's gonna get full results out of this, but, but I was excited kind of making this connection. Um, there's a, a few people in Edinburgh doing databases and language integrated queries where, where they think about MD. So maybe there, there should be something to do in that space. Uh, I really don't have much expertise there yet, so, but in my university I do though, we have lots of people who do databases, so hopefully something will come out. And also in Edinburgh, <laughs> we have a very strong systems team who, who work on, on what they call it performance portability. What it means, you use some kind of clever normal form and then you can deploy it on a GPU, deploy it on an FPGA and so on, uh, and, and they're using very similar tricks and techniques. I'm basically just following Sam Lindley's path through here because he's, <laughs> he's been doing language integrated queries in, in, this, in this method. He's like the MD Wiz. Uh, in, 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 the, in the school. So, well, he's no longer in the school now, he's in a different school. Um, so just in summary, Frex, you can try it. I mean, uh, it's now run on the latest Haskell, so, so you can just uh, uh, clone it and, and, and have Aleph. Um, or if you wanna get involved in independent Frex, then, then come and talk to me, because I'm currently looking at Idris too, but if you have a favorite si other system, yeah, why not? The more the merrier, because uh, at the end of the day, when you come to wire it up to the type checker, it's gonna be a bit different, and it's just, and, and I find that super interesting. And that's it, so um, we'll take questions now, thanks.
Wait, do you want to be recorded? Sure. So whether you have normal forms in your current meta theories matters hugely, right? If and just saying, oh, let's just throw in quotient types um, I'm is not only good for the theoretician. You, you know, right now we have green slime. Maybe it'll be pink fluff, but y you're just pushing it around. You, you have to have normal forms for it to be <coughs> computationally effective. Um, Some kind of normal. So for these ones, you don't need you don't need quotients. So you can no come right up. Right, 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 exactly. Yeah. So like, but like, how do you know if you pick up a random algebra, which one has a normal form? That's that's the hard part. I don't know. I, I, sus I mean, my initial guess would be it's undecidable, and I've tried to prove that. Mm. I've not tried very hard. I tried to put in a couple of algebras, even if they're effectively given, might not be effective, and, and so on. There's but some meta theorems around there. Uh, you talk to me. Yes, uh, please. Yes, yes. But but uh, um, but even if not. Um, so there's two things, right? So so one is uh, whether I can do it with quotients. So for example, <laughs> if I have some clever rewriting algorithm under the hood, plus some proof that it always terminates. That is my, my normal forms, and, and I could probably fit it here. I, I've, not, I've just not tried because the, the, the usual ones can be uh, effect, you know, uh, inductively given, uh, which I, f I found um, surprising. Because at the end of the day here, to make type checking work, I only need to extend by a finite set of the variables in the open term. Um, how do you do that inductively? Because they are variables, I can order them. I mean, it, it's, it's as simple as that. Uh, if you have decidable equality, so you can't extend but by a type on which uh, you don't have decidable equality. But I'm equality. talking about the names of the variables. In I, I know, so, so what I'm saying, ju just to get, I think just to get simple type checking modular equations, we have enough, we might, I don't know, but I can't say, an, you know, absolute because the proof will, the proof will be the eating, right? But, but um, I think we can get some mileage for that just with the side of equality on variable names, mm -hmm. okay? Once we get there, we can try to work further. I mean, I do, ha I do want a, a nice type theory of quotients that might not have, well that might not co commit me to higher structures and so on, and it, you know, I know. But that's a different bag. <laughs> that's a different bag. <laughs> okay, so, 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 so I, am fo re I will really want to have quotient types. I think this could be orthogonal uh, in some way or another, yeah. Thanks. Hello. Uh, Yes, yeah, so this is something I've wanted for a long time. Uh, but one, one question I have is that uh, when you're doing type inference, it's not just you have like some terms and some equations. Um, you also introduce meta variables. So have you, have you thought about like representations of meta variables and um, things like this? I thought a bit, not a lot. <laughs> and and uh, I'm, in a sense, I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting to see what I get. Once I, I just want to teach it was about threats for a bit and then see what I have at the other end. And then firstly, the, the easiest thing I can do there, see how much mileage I get out of that and then think more. Um, because some of those normal forms are inductively given, you could try to think of maybe with views from the left, I could uh, do, do a little bit of more, you know, more unification happening um, there. Not sure because you, you will have, you, at some point you have to say, well, maybe there's a new type variable, you know, a new meta variable coming up here that's not in the, in, the, in the free extension. There might be some um, wiggle there. Mm. I mean, going back to Jacques' question, I really do want to have a very nice quotient type so that I could do Marcelo's um, structure inside type theory the way he's doing it. Um, of course, other people are doing it in different ways, and, and, and that's, that's super cool as well. Thanks a lot. Sorry about that. Oh.